Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Krall, and I have the pleasure of being the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. And so I get the privilege also of being able to welcome you here tonight. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to first acknowledge uh, and respect the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose traditional territories the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Masonic peoples whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. So welcome to IdeaFest and to the Faculty of Social Sciences event is apathy about climate change, the greatest threat to the planet. As I said, I'm really delighted to be here. I um, have been looking forward to this panel presentation for several weeks now. Uh, I don't think it can be overstated how important tonight's topic is. But despite the potentially, uh, potentially disastrous consequences of inaction, uh, the question really is, why are people, or why are some people, apathetic when it comes to the environment? By examining responses to climate change from different perspectives, our panelists tonight will talk about the science of climate change. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to tonight's uh, moderator, Social Sciences Associate Dean of Research, Dr. Michael Masson. As uh, Dean Krull has said, I'll serve as the moderator for tonight's event. Um, and I'll just start by laying out just the general groundwork for how things will work. We have four speakers this evening, and they will uh, each make a presentation in turn of about 10 minutes or so in length. And uh, we're, we've arranged things so that we would like the question period to happen at the end of all four presentations. So I'd ask you to hold your questions until all the, of the presentations have been made then the floor will be open to entertain your questions and the panelists will answer them. Either um, someone who you might direct your question toward or all the panelists might join in in answering. So you're welcome to do that after all the presentations have been made. So let me just say a couple of words about who the panelists this evening are. The first person from whom you'll hear is Dr. Robert Gifford from the Department of Psychology. Uh, Bob is also cross-listed in the School of Environmental Studies. And um, Bob's research examines the interfaces between environmental, social, and personality psychology. And he develops tools to measure human characteristics in each of these domains. The second speaker will be Dr. Johan Fetema, who is chair and professor in the Department of Geography. And Johan's um, main research interest is in understanding, with the help of computer models, how human activities alter climate and how climate change impacts human and natural systems. The third speaker is Dr. Chris Bone, who is an assistant professor in the Department of, Ge of Geography. And his teaching and research emphasize the use of spatial data to explore climate and human-driven natural disturbances, as well as their impacts on diverse human populations. Our final speaker this evening will be uh, Ms. Katrin Lacroix, who is a PhD candidate in the School of Environmental Studies. And Katrin's work examines pro-environmental behavior in the context of climate change to help find effective strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So please uh, join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Bob Gifford. Yeah. All right. Can you hear me at the top? Okay, thank you. First, I want to really thank you on behalf of the panelists for coming out, for showing your interest. Uh, that's what we need, is interest uh, in this topic. Uh, I forget if I put it into my slides, for example, but no less than an eminence than Barack Obama said in 2014 that this was the most important problem facing this century. And uh, I always think, well, he had to deal with a lot of different kinds of problems when he was president. For him to say this was the most defining problem of the 21st century is really something to me. So uh, I'm glad you agree enough to come out anyway and, and uh, talk about it. So each of us is going to talk for five or ten minutes, and then we'll, we'll get into discussions. I have a uh, uh, page down here. 
who that he can use that little. I want to say a few words about the, the t title. Being a, a writer, I'm fussy about words. And apathy, I guess, in the dictionary means indifference to something. And I think maybe that's not the best word for the, for the title, because I think a lot of people are concerned, which to me is a little bit more than being apathetic. I suppose true apathy is a problem for, for the planet, but I prefer to think of apathy as being something that's not all that common, even in the general population. I think something like 75 or 80 percent of Canadians are concerned, and I wouldn't call that apathetic. But if somebody is apathetic, that is a problem. So I like to use uh, un unfulfilled concern because uh, outside this room, at least, uh, a lot of people are not are concerned, but they aren't really doing as much as they might do to help solve the problem. The last part of the title is about the planet, and I think if you think about it, the planet's going to go on way longer than you and me. Uh, it, but. It's not going to go along. If we don't do something more about climate change, it's, it's going to take quite a different shape than it is now. So we're not talking about the, the future of the planet per se, but we are talking about the planet as a habitable place for most of the people uh, who live on it. So yeah, there's the Obama quote there uh, that I think is an important one from somebody who should know uh, was well informed and had to deal with a whole lot of other problems besides uh, climate change. One point that somebody else made but resonates with me is we talk about environmental problems as if the problem is in the environment, and of course in a way it is, but uh, somebody said, no, it's not an environmental problem, it's a human problem, because it's humans collectively that have created uh, most of the problems that are above the baseline of the natural uh, set of events that, that happens anyway. And so you can say that uh, it's not really an environmental problem that we're dealing with, it's a human problem, because that also brings to the fore you know, who's going to solve this problem is humans. Uh, we hope anyway that we, since we created the problem, it's up to us to try to also to solve that problem. Uh, so my own recent specialty has been in this notion called the dragons of inaction, which uh, is essentially a whole lot of psychological barriers or obstacles that people have that prevent them from turning their concern into action. And uh, I won't list off the 40 of these things, but I grouped them into seven sort of categories, which did I put them here? Uh, I didn't put all of them here. I'm happy to share them with anybody. And I guess that's, uh, if you're interested, you can see more than, you know, the five minutes that I have here from this website that talks a lot about these dragons of inaction. Essentially, these are you know, if you want to be positive about it, they're barriers that hold people back. If you want to be sort of negative about it, they're just excuses or justifications that people use for not taking more action uh, for climate change. But two of the dragons that are the most important probably for most people are what I call CGA. CGA means conflicting goals and aspirations. That is, you know, people have lots of things they want to get done. They want to take care of their health, their grandchildren, their finances, uh, and whatever. And a lot of times those things have a, take a pr higher priority than taking care of climate change. And so in some sense, that's legitimate. We can't all be devoted entirely to climate change, and so that's one of the problems. In the US, a lot of surveys show, for example, that concern is high until people say, well, how does it rank compared to these 20 other things? And then suddenly climate change sinks down to like number 20 on the list. So it's as if the concern is real, but kind of shallow compared to a lot of other goals and aspirations that people have. The other one, PLC, is perceived lack of control. That is, what can a, one person do? I don't know, you know, you know, this is government problem, this is, you know, industry problem, this is somebody else's problem. Even if I do everything I can, you know, it won't make much difference. I usually answer when people say to that, uh, well, I guess you don't vote either right then because, uh, you know, you're only one voter too. And, 
usually people say, yeah, I guess that's a, you got a point there. We all have to take action or, you know, something won't happen and we all should vote. I think there's probably everybody in this room is a voter. There are some hopeful signs. Uh, I think awareness of climate change has dramatically increased over the last 10 or 15 years, and awareness is the first stage. Uh, there's a lot of uh, educational sources, which I believe we're going to talk about later in, so that there are, there are uh, mechanisms and uh, places to go to learn more about it and to learn what people can do, etc. So it's not hopeless. I think that's what I want to say. I think if we can be better collectively uh, we can probably, I have to say honestly, I don't believe it every day, but I think we have to give it a try, we have to do what we can, and that we can manage to adapt to mitigate climate change and to adapt to it successfully. So I'm an environmental psychologist, that's the kind of field I'm part of, and our job is to find these ways to help people move from inaction to action through uh, messages that move people to finding interventions that work as a, to assess interventions that might work to look at policies and regulations to see if they resonate with people and if they're effective and uh, so that's our our goal is to try to figure out ways to educate to inform and to tell people what can be done just one example of one of my own studies when we ask people uh, you know, how willing are you to help? And we told them, you're going to have to sacrifice because of climate change. The motivation to change was much lower than if we said something like, uh, you can be a kind of block leader. You can empower other people by making changes. That got a lot more uh, resonance, a lot more traction, I should say, uh, toward getting people to help. So an empowerment message, for example, is more powerful than a sacrifice message. And environmental psychologists collectively are looking at 20 or 30 such message, message differences that, that change people's motivation to act and their actual ability to act. Okay. So uh, just in closing, uh, what we do as environmental psychologists to try to help as behavioral scientists is to, first of all, just measure who is doing what, which are the most impactful behaviors, who's engaging in which of those. Old people, young people, rich people, poor people, people of different cultures are not engaging in impact, climate impact actions to the same degree. So just like doing a medical diagnosis, first we have to figure out who's doing what, when, and to what extent with which kind of behavior. Second, as I said, our job is to figure out interventions that might work, that reward people for what they're doing, that make them feel good about what they're doing, etc. Third, what we have to do is to help people understand that climate change is already happening. That is, if you look around Victoria, you look around any place, you will find people who say, it's not like it used to be. Uh, I've, uh, maybe I'll talk later about my own personal epiphany, which was long after I got active about it anyway, but you see something, you engage something, and you say, wow, things are not the same anymore. So the more that we can get people to understand that it's already happening, even here in Victoria, the more likely people are to, to, to act. The fourth thing is that we try to get people to engage in the policy process. I like to say, if you're not at the table, whether it's at the university, where you work, at home, neighborhood, uh, organization, then nothing's going to happen if people don't join in the policy process. So we try to find ways to encourage people to get involved. And finally, uh, we need to do two things. That is to reward what I call the mules. Mules sounds like a negative thing, but mules are the people, like probably some of you, who are already doing everything humanly possible. I think people like that need to be re uh, rewarded either with recognition or with some kind of tax break or some sort of money because they're already carrying a heavy load like mules do. And last, there's in my little eco-menagerie is what, what I call honeybees. Honeybees are people who are doing the right thing for the climate, but not necessarily for environmental reasons. Uh, just one example would be the person who's riding her bike to to work or to university, and you ask why, and she says, for my health. And so I say, you're doing it for the environment? 
no, I'm just doing it for my health. And for me, that's fine. I don't care if you're doing it for the health, to keep the bike company alive, or whatever, because it's what we do that counts, it's not why we do it. So these are honeybees who insulate only to save money on their electric bill. Fine, that's fine, that's good, because it's the right sort of action. Okay, thank you, I'll turn it over to the next panel. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Tedema from Geography. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Room full, that's great. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a climate science perspective on this whole topic. And um, I've been a part of two IPCC reports. Um, I've done quite a bit of work in that area. And therefore, what you see before you is one of the most ineffective communicators that we have on the planet, which is a climate scientist. We have done a really bad job of communicating to you. and. Um, to me, the main message here tonight is to think about communication. And what I'd like to do for the next few slides is just to give you a little bit of an idea about what we actually know about climate science and how long we've known it. Because I think many people, particularly in the US, think that clim al climate change started with Al Gore. And it didn't. You know, There were other people that had done a lot of work before Al Gore showed up. So I just want to kind of emphasize a little bit. So what you're seeing here, actually, is a climate model run. So I work on this model. And what you're seeing, actually, the white stuff, cloud, clouds, OK? So this is a total water vapor column. And where it's orange, it's actually more or less raining. So what you're seeing is just the total amount of water in the atmosphere. And you can sort of see the movement of this. The reason I like to show this is that a climate model really is doing nothing more than every half hour for 300 years in a row, simulating essentially weather. Right? And then we take those average statistics, and that becomes climate. The reason climate is hard to communicate to people is that it is statistics. Who loves statistics? <laughs> Nobody. OK. So uh, statistics are wonderful. Really, they are. Um, at least I think so. So anyway, and climate science at the end of the day is actually nothing more really than, let me see if this works, please. There it goes. Oh, you're just going to do this. Uh, there you go. Quick lesson in climate science. All climate science is is taking the temperature of the Earth, which really means the amount of energy in the Earth. Temperature is nothing more than a measure of the total amount of energy held by an object. Okay. Now it turns out, in order to have a temperature, you have to have energy, and you have to get that energy from somewhere. So that energy actually comes in, in the red arrows here, in terms of short wave radi what we call short wave radiation from the sun, or solar radiation. Short wavelength uh, electromagnetic radiation. It gets reflected off clouds, off the land, and half of it roughly gets absorbed by the planet at the surface. About a third is absorbed by the atmosphere on the way down, mostly by ozone and oxygen, which are really important for that reason, and we have issues with that too. Once that planet receives that energy, it has to get rid of it or it would cook. So what we do is we have to get rid of it. We can evaporate water. We can just send heat up into the atmosphere. We can radiate at long wavelengths, much longer, 10 micrometers instead of 0.5, long wave or terrestrial radiation up into the atmosphere. But the atmosphere has a very few gases that are greenhouse gases that absorb most of that energy. And they don't let it through to the back to space. So this absorption then c causes the atmosphere to radiate up and down, more down than up, because of the structure of the atmosphere. And so what we end up with is what we call the greenhouse effect. Okay? And so we have both external factors driving climate and internal factors. And most of the climate change that we've seen over the millennia have been not the external, but rather the internal things. Okay? A bit of both. So in order to be a good climate scientist, you have to understand both the external and the internal factors that cause the climate to change. Oops. So just to give you an idea, humans can interfere everywhere we have these circles to some extent. 
we interfere with the ozone in the atmosphere using CFCs or other chemicals and that causes these two arrows to change okay the proportion we interfere with actually clouds to some degree with by emission of particulates we interfere with albedo of the surface by cutting down forests and putting different kinds of land surfaces in there we change by changing that land surface we also change the ratio of water that's being evaporated to other other mechanisms so how long have we been doing climate science well people have been thinking about climate for a very long time and I don't know who were the first but I'm sure it was ancestors many thousands of years ago but if we think about formal climate right and we can think about other people like fossil records Agassiz and others but Joseph Fourier a uh, mathematician well known if you are familiar with statistics and other things uh, first thought about the idea that actually the planet was warmer than it should be and how could that be so he thought about this blanket idea and he formulated the first hypothesis of how this might work he had it wrong but that's okay he got there most of them <laughs> so the next person that was really important I'm only going to do a few here because I don't have time but uh, was John Tyndall who was hugely important he figured out how much each of the gases in the atmosphere, which were still being discovered at the time, were actually able to absorb radiation. And from that, he knew in 1859, and actually did these experiments from 56 to 59, that CO2 was a greenhouse gas. And if you change CO2, then you would change the climate. Okay. Sventi Arrhenius then, and by 1900, had done the very first calculation of a greenhouse effect and if you doubled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere what would happen three to five degrees warmer I can do that on the back of an envelope all I need is basic radiation law of physics either Stefan Boltzmann or Planck's law doesn't matter which one you use and an understanding of what CO2 does we've known this for over 150 years and we're still arguing about whether CO2 is a greenhouse gas mm -hmm. clearly we don't know how to communicate right so uh, we can go on, particularly Milankovitch there in the 20s and the 30s, who figured out ice ages. And by the way, one of the main reasons that Arrhenius did that calculation is that he was worried that we were going into another ice age. He knew we were from the fossil record and other things. And he wanted to stop the ice age. So he figured the best way to do it is to just double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And his recommendation was burn coal as much as you can, as quickly as you can. <laughs> and we will stop the next ice age. Okay? So then others, and particularly Guy Stewart, Callender over there, uh, and then Roger Revelle and Keeling and all these people really fleshed this out much more. And then we started getting climate models and we started to understand chaos a little bit better. Let's skip all that. So what about the history of the climate of the Earth? And this is one of those things that a lot of people are sort of in the dark on. But if we look at the CO2 record of the planet, it very much follows the temperature record of the planet, too. The biggest catastrophe we ever saw on the planet in terms of its climate happened right about here. Terrestrial plants evolved. And what they did was they decided to use up all the CO2. There was a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. They sucked it all out. Carboniferous came along and plants took it all out and the earth got cold. Immediately went into an ice age, massive ice age for a long time. And then we warmed up because of plate tectonics putting more CO2 in the atmosphere. Then we had a big continental collision. We stuck it back out. And now we're actually still in a coldest, one of the coldest phases of the entire Earth's history. If we look at a billion years, okay? Now, we haven't been around a billion years. So part of the problem here is figuring out that it was a really different world when we talked about these things. If you put a human on the Earth up here, they'd die because there's no oxygen. Those plants had to make that oxygen, right? So we have to put these things in context. And often people will say, well, it was warmer in the past. Yep. It was, but it was a different world. Notice when this closed, we also changed ice ages, for example, because of the circulation of the ocean. So we've known all that. So really quickly, to personalize this a little bit, this is when I started giving this talk. So I've been really lazy and not changed my PowerPoint, but I kind of like to show that we've been knowing, doing this for a while. So this is the carbon dioxide record in the atmosphere. Uh, so observations, and you see a cycle in there which has to do with the greening of the planet and so on, okay? 
And we, but then we used the ice core records to look at CO2 in a much longer period. So we had high CO2, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high. Notice it's a, what we call a sawtooth curve. We come out quickly, go back down. These are the ice ages. Here, 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 and here. Okay. Humans developed as a species somewhere in there. It keeps changing. It's like changed a lot since I was a student. Um, and the last glacial maximum was about 18,000 years ago. 8,000 years ago, we had domestication of plants and animals. Notice that the amount of CO2 was about 270 parts per million. Okay. Industrial Revolution begins about there, about 100, 250 years ago. 20 parts per million change over that entire time. Hypothesized, actually, in part to be due to humans doing agriculture. 1900, my grandfather was born in 1901. Okay. 20 more parts per million in 250 years. I was born right about there, very close. Another 20 parts per million in one lifetime. Two lifetimes, my dad's. 2005, less than 50 years. 2017, look at the rate of change that's happening here and how fast it's happening. Compare that to rate of change, 8,000 years, about 100 parts per million, and here we did it in what, 50? Okay, this is unprecedented. Never happened before in the record that we can find. There might be one or two periods that we're looking into geologically, but it's really tricky, and it's almost certainly to be slower. So, it's a different world. It's a new graph, and it keeps changing, and it keeps going up. It doesn't ever seem to flatten out. We can talk about rates of change. The rate of change during the la from melting from the last ice age to kind of the present period, or uh, let's say there, we are 20 times, changing 20 times faster in the last century, and we're currently on a, probably another 20 to 30 part times faster. So, this black line is the observed temperature record. Okay. The blue lines here are model simulations. If we were to simulate the climate of the planet with our model, and each of these little blue lines is a separate model, the, black, the big blue line is the average, of those models. What we're doing is we're simulating the climate, but only natural forcings. Volcanoes that we know about, and essentially solar activity. Solar activity has declined in the last 50 years, so we should be cooling. We're also going into an ice age, but that's going to take another 80,000 years. Now we run our models, same exact thing, but the only thing we add is how much carbon dioxide we've added, and aerosols. Notice that our model coincides really well pretty much with the record. It's the only way we can replicate it. Sorry, I'm probably over, right? <laughs> we'll end there and go to the next one. Our next speaker will be Dr. Chris Bone from the Department of Ge Geography. Thank you, Mike. And uh, yeah, just to echo others' comments, thank you all for uh, coming this evening. Um, it's great to see such a, a wonderful turnout for these events. Um, what I'm going to do today is just sort of talk for uh, the next 10 minutes a little bit about the relationship between climate change, natural disturbances, and a little bit about climate change apathy. And, and natural disturbances are things that I've been studying for uh, onwards of about 15 years now. And I'd like to sort of kind of try to paint a picture about why natural disturbances can sometimes be a very difficult or challenging mechanism of which to understand climate change through, and even sort of hint a little bit towards how natural disturbances can be used as a tool for apathy or as a tool by, you know, whether it be skeptics or climate deniers, um, for a way to sort of kind of simplify a message that um, may not be entirely accurate. So what are natural disturbances, uh, kind of a sort of a textbook definition, is a natural disturbance, and we've, you know, we've, we've seen these in the news every single day from different places around the world. Essentially, it's when we get some sort of shift in environmental conditions, whether they be local or sort of broader scale, and they produce some pronounced change in our local ecosystems or some sort of societal change, okay? 
at small scales, you can think about, you know, these, these disturbances being things like tornadoes that affect very small areas. At larger scales, things like hurricanes um, or massive cyclones that impact coastlines and, and millions of people. Uh, can I just ask, what's the top left here? I think most of us, I feel, from BC know that yeah, this is a very emblematic photo of, of a natural disturbance. So obviously the, the sort of upper left and, and bottom right here are uh, two natural disturbances that us uh, folks in British Columbia are very familiar with. The sort of mountain pine beetle epidemic that's uh, the most recent one that sort of began in the mid-90s in the interior of British Columbia and it's still sort of petering on in BC a little bit but mostly now making its march across the boreal forest and very close to the border of Saskatchewan. We've got wildfires, which, uh, you know, last year was, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit, uh, was obviously a very um, important year for that. Um, so there shouldn't be any doubt when we look at research that climate change plays a real significant role in these types of disturbances, hurricanes, wind events. Um, there's, you know, the more recent research on the sort of warming of oceans leading to more energy in the oceans, which for places like Victoria that are sitting on coastlines experiencing greater and greater uh, turbidity from wind. Uh, so there's, there, you know, the abundance of research that, that points to the causal relationship between a warming climate or a shifting climate in some respects and how we're noticing these disturbances take place over time um, is quite evident, quite startling. Um, and so the kind of question when, when you think about this and, and, you know, we see images of these things every, every year, especially in the summertime in British Columbia, um, you know, a question is why haven't these natural disturbances that we see that have such big social, ecological, and especially a huge financial, if anything's going to motivate us uh, and motivate the government, you think uh, sort of that financial motivation of the impacts of losing mass amounts of forests or alterations to, to different ecosystems. I often think about the irony of Fort McMurray fire that took place on the, basically the footsteps of uh, the largest oil patch in Canada. And kind of, you know, you can kind of compare those two and juxtapose them to, to really see climate change taking place right uh, next door to one another, these, these two things. Um, so it's, it's interesting that this hasn't really motivated, and I don't just say just us, I mean, we're all here for, for you know, this event, but motivating us on a, on a grander scale in terms of motivating government, motivating businesses, motivating industry. Why haven't there sort of been more of a realization that these disturbances are a mechanism that, that we actually need to uh, deal with it? So, I mean, part of the issue, and, and I'm going to talk about the problems of simplifying the um, message of climate change, and in doing so, I'm going to simplify <laughs> the problem of simplifying the message here a little bit, uh, just to get through this talk. But here's a, a really interesting graph. And this is every major hurricane. Um, so uh, uh, basically a, a major storm that's hit the United States with um, my, uh, wind over 115 miles an hour, okay? Since 1851 all the way to 2015. So each one of these bars represents a different storm. The height of the bar represents the number of year, the number of days that the previous storm took place. So the higher the bar, the longer time it's actually been since a storm has taken place. Okay, and if you look at this bar on the far right here, this was actually Hurricane Matthew that took place in 2016, and this was the you could see there was a you know over 4,000 days until Hurricane between Hurricane Matthew and the previous hurricane that hit the United States. And so this was such a significant event, but you know, what happened in between these years? 2005, people remember Hurricane Katrina. Uh, there were other hurricanes that took place that year. Um, and you know, inconvenient truth, we talk about Al Gore came out in 2006. And Al Gore presented this message that these hurricanes, we're gonna start seeing these storms far more often every year. And sure enough, what happened? We went 10 years without a hurricane, right? And what was really interesting, and a lot of people have written about this, sort of the absence of disturbances, right? The absence of perceived change actually adds a lot towards the uncertainties that people have. And you could argue to somewhat towards this sense of apathy or this, this confusion over really is climate change taking place? 
Um, you know, never mind that all these sort of, you know, people that were kind of purporting this never mentioned anything that the oceans were still heating up while hurricanes weren't happening, right? And just because it didn't hit the US doesn't mean there wasn't a hurricane, right? There were hurricanes that, that, that happened every, every year that a lot of countries suffered from. But this idea of a lack of something that's there um, really kind of, cr the, a lot of skeptics and deniers would put this forth as a mechanism to say, where's the climate change, right? If you kind of go forward to Hurricane Harvey in 2017, this is one of th the three of the five most destructive or most costly hurricanes in US history happened in last year in 2017. Hurricane Harvey was so big that the National Weather Service had to actually add more colors to their mapping uh, the way they actually map the, the precipitation because they've never seen that much precipitation take place, all right? So what's happened? We've had gaps in the absence of something, you know, doesn't necessarily mean climate change is not taking place. Now that the conditions are back and fostering these hurricanes to come into closer to landfall into the U.S., we are seeing far bigger, more costly, more destructive, and more socially compromising um, uh, hurricanes. It's the same thing with wildfires. In California and British Columbia, there's this sort of um, rhetoric around the fact that we have actually seen less fire area burned over, the, uh, over recent decades in both places like California and in British Columbia. Nobody talks about this idea that fire suppression efforts, right, the billions of dollars that we spend to put fires out might be causing this. But instead, it's the types of fires that are happening. 14 of California's largest 20, uh, 14 of the largest 20 fires that have taken place in the history of California have happened since 2000, okay? In British Columbia, it's the same thing. This graph was put together by the CBC from uh, data from the BC Wildfire Service in July of last year. And it shows that you know, 1958 was by far the largest area burned uh, across the province. And you can see it's not, I put little red notches there. These are the fire years since 2010. It's not like we're seeing more area burned over time. We're actually doing more of a job to protect our fires. But you could argue we're seeing larger and larger fires. This was put together in July. This doesn't include that large fire that hit west of Quinell in the interior in October. That red bar I extended over to account for that fire. So over almost half of the total area burned in British Columbia last year was by one fire. Sure, it was an accumulation of multiple fires that came together, but it says something. The way these disturbances and the way our ecosystems responding is changing. And it's a very, very complex, uh, you know, climate change is complex. I think part of the problem of what we've done over time is simplify this message. And we always hear the public needs a simplified message to be able to understand climate change. And I think that's a problem. I think that simplicity has really led to a lot of misinformation. It's led to us not actually being able to think or comprehend the uncertainties that are inherent in how our world is changing and how the climate's changing. And I think to get around this, there's, there's a real need to change messaging. That I think a messaging of climate change has to come from an idea of of thinking about complexities, thinking about uncertainties, that it's not just this linear change that we see over time. And how this messaging takes place, you know, I, um, you know, Johan's my, my department chair, so I'll, I'll be careful what I say about climate scientists, but, <laughs> but you know, you got, the, you got the scientists doing science, right? You got the activists out on the street, you've got the deniers denying, You've got the public kind of saying, what do we do? And I think it's time to break down these barriers and, and actually think about how do these different groups start coming together to sort of really think about this change in messaging, right? Let the messaging happen in a more productive and a much more informed way. I think universities are really a great place for this to happen where collaboration between you know, uh, communities and, and researchers and students uh, can, can really be fostered. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Pardon me? Yes. Our final speaker is Corinne Lacroix from the School of Environmental Studies. Uh, Corinne, are you going to give any assistance in getting your set up?
Hi. I'd like you to join me on a journey. So I took this photo while camping with friends on Galliano Island in July 2015. It was a beautiful day with clear blue skies. After dinner, we sat on the beach and we watched a sunset. And there was no rain in the forecast that night, so I suggested we not put up the rain fly on our tent because I wanted to see the stars. But when I woke up the next morning, scattered inside the tent were what looked like little white snowflakes. Slightly confused, I stepped outside, and this is what I saw. All right. We're dreaming. Honestly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this is what I saw. <laughs> so seeing this hazy orange sky combined with the smell of smoke, I realized that those little snowflakes were actually ash from the forest fires. And for the rest of the day, it felt like we were on the set of an apocalyptic movie. I had itchy dry eyes and a scratchy throat. And in that moment, the fires felt quite close. So as someone who studies perceptions of climate change, that left me wondering what other people might be thinking and what kinds of associations they might be making as they live through similar or worse experiences. So I asked myself, no. Okay. <laughs> Does personal experience with forest fires change a person's perception of climate change risk? And how does that relate to that person's support for climate policy? So I decided to study this. The following year, I surveyed over 400 Canadians before, during, and after the forest fire season. I asked them about their perceptions of climate change risk in terms of threats to their well-being or their perceptions of current impacts. I also asked them if they supported 14 different climate policies so for example, having more strict fuel efficiency standards for cars. I asked them if they had personally experienced forest fires and how often they heard about the fires in the media or through conversation. And just uh, a reminder, this, when I did this study, it was 2016. So that was the year of the Fort McMurray fire, which was named the top Canadian news story of the year. So many people were indirectly exposed to the fire that year. So what I found was that yes, higher exposure to forest fires correlated with a higher perception of climate change risk. And also that people reporting bigger changes in climate change risk perception over the course of my study also tended to report bigger changes in climate policy support but one important finding stood out, and that's that not everyone reacts the same way. So your personal experience, your background, your beliefs, your political ideology, all these things affect how you see and interpret an event like a forest fire. So I found that those who said protecting the environment was an important value for them, and those that were surrounded by family and friends that supported more eco-friendly behavior tended to report higher perceptions of climate change risk. And beliefs were also important. So those individuals that believe that climate change plays a role in the frequency and intensity of fires, and those that perceive a high level of scientific agreement on climate change tend to perceive more risk. So I want to take a look at that last point a bit more closely, and that's the perception of scientific agreement on climate change. So this slide shows climate change risk perception and how it changes throughout the course of my study. On the vertical axis, we have climate change risk perception on a scale of one to five, one being that it does not pose a serious risk, and five that the risks are very serious. And on the horizontal axis, we have the time frame of the study from late April to mid-November, and I surveyed participants in 
April, July, and November. And if you look at the legend of the, on the right, you will see that the different colors represent groups of individuals with different levels of perceived scientific agreement. So the yellow line here shows the group of individuals that perceive that more than 95% of climate scientists agree that climate change is happening and that it's human caused. The gray line is between 86 and 95%. The orange between 66 and 85. And the blue line is for those that believe in less than 65% scientific agreement. So here you can see that the individuals that have the highest level of perceived scientific agreement also have the highest perceptions of risk and vice versa. And by the way, the correct answer is more than 97% of climate scientists agree that climate change is happening and it's human caused. So taking a few steps back to situate this research in a broader societal context, why is it important? So Nearly all scientists agree that the Earth is getting warmer and that this is caused by our greenhouse gas emissions. So logically, if we want to minimize the impacts, we need to decrease our emissions. And I think that decreasing our emissions cannot happen if we don't change our behavior. Just to be clear, when I say pro-environmental behavior, environmental psychologists tend to categorize this behavior into two groups. The first group is the private sphere behaviors, and those are the ones that most often come to mind when we think of pro-environmental behavior. And these are things like energy conservation, what we buy or how we travel. But there's also the public sphere behaviors that less often come to mind. And these are things like voting, participating in demonstrations, writing to your elected official, voicing your concern by signing petitions or participating in public consultation periods. So all these public sphere behaviors can trigger changes in the systems around us, and these changes can make it easier for us to act. And my role as a researcher is to try to, 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 to understand that, yes, we need to change, but also that there are barriers to being more pro-environmental, and I want to try and understand these barriers better to find ways to remove them. So how do we slay the dragon? That's the main question. So as Dr. Gifford mentioned earlier, most people are concerned about climate change, but many still experience strong psychological barriers. And based on what we know about these barriers, I want to issue a challenge to all of us here today. Let's lead by example. So in another study, we found that social norms are an important barrier when it comes to driving less and to making more sustainable food choices. These are behaviors that are visible to others and often shared with others. So taking the lead and doing it yourself sends a message. These behaviors also happen to have a very large mitigation potential. So if you picture a pie representing the total carbon footprint of the average Canadian, what we eat, what we buy, the electricity we use, and how we travel, all of those things. If you picture that pie, choosing a more fuel-efficient car and eating less meat can reduce a person's carbon footprint by up to one-third of that pie. And let's not forget the public sphere behaviors, which can create changes in the infrastructure around us and make it easier for others to follow our lead. So our behavior is affected by extreme weather events, but it's also affected by others around us through social support or through conversation. And these are behaviors that we can do that are, are noticeable, that uh, can lead, can motivate others around us to follow our lead and also have large positive environmental impacts. Thank you. Thanks very much, Corinne.